Graduates Conversations podcast. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's episode of Conversations Interpreting and Translating podcast. Uh, now, as we do three times a year, I have Hayley Armstrong here today, uh, the managing editor of Oz of In Touch magazine. And uh, as usual, she's joining me from all the way uh, from Mexico. So thank you very much uh, for, I guess, staying up. Uh, we're you're a few <laughs> hours behind, aren't you, Hayley? How's it going? Yeah, just a few. Good, thanks. How are you, Fatih? Very good, thank you. Look, good to see you again. And Likewise. um uh, let's talk about the autumn edition of the In Touch magazine. Now, I've sure. had a look at some of the special features there, and uh, thank you for sending through uh, the link to the magazine. It's, it's a very, very engaging read, as always. Um, and I had a look there, and there was some uh, particular uh, feature of this particular edition was uh, uh, about legal translating and interpreting. Um, and I saw that there were some online sources and resources that you were sharing with the practitioners. And, and uh, as a practicing interpreter myself, um, I found them to be very, very useful. So uh, can you tell us a little bit about those? Sure, I'd love to. Um, so there's two apps. One is Law Term Finder, uh, which um, is an app that's uh, to help people translate between the legal terminology between the two languages. So it's a bilingualized dictionary on, on in an app form through with various languages. Another app is Legal Literate, which is mainly um, Australian English legal terms that have been translated into plain English. So when you're interpreting, if you come across a term you 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 know can't think of it in the moment you can look it up and get the plain English version to then interpret into your other language I, I had a look at that uh, app actually and it's, it's super useful and the best thing about it it is is that it's, it's Australian context it's not just any mm -hmm. legal um, dictionary or, or glossary it's uh, about the Australian context and um, you know uh, the Australian legal realm can be uh, quite um, unique well it's distinct isn't it yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've, uh, I find that too with because um, I I uh, specialize in the legal field too, but in Mexican context, Mexican legal context into U.S. English usually. And yeah, if you can find a dictionary that's specific to your the legal context you're working in, it's so helpful. Um, so I, yeah, that that legal literate one does look really really good for that reason that it is yeah. an Australian context. And uh, it, it's got a quite a user-friendly interface as well, I think, um, very mm -hmm. easy to use. So uh, I think uh, it'll be very, very uh, useful for any interpreter translator out there. And, and the Law Term Finder, that one's uh, more like a portal, I guess. It's a website, isn't it? Uh, yes, it does seem to be more web-based. What about uh, some of the, I'm just having a look at different um, types of resources here. Uh, there's the Indigenous Legal Interpreting Vocabulary Standard and Protocols. There's a plain English legal dictionary there as well that I think would be uh, super useful. Um, and uh, I can see that you've got a whole bunch of live hyperlinks in the uh, issue as well, haven't you? Yes, we've been doing that. Um, I think since last issue now, this is the second issue where we've um, included live links. Well, I, I know that when I'm reading something, especially online, I always want to click on something <laughs> interesting to go, in, to go and look at it later. So, yeah, we are trying to include links where possible. And uh, one of them is, yeah, the Indigenous Legal Interpreting uh, Dictionary, which is an on, it's available online for free and um, is, does look very useful for the legal settings for uh, interpreters of Indigenous languages. Um, and I think there's a big focus these days for more simple language, isn't there? Especially with, uh, uh, within regards to COVID-19 and um, within regards to vaccine, uh, the vaccination rollout in Australia as well. Uh, yeah. I think there's there's quite a bit of pressure uh, on I guess uh, governments and organisations to produce their texts in in a more simple in a more plain uh, version because uh, maybe they don't realise at the time uh, that uh, most of this information actually is going to be translated as well. It's not just you know they write it in English yeah. and then that's it. Um, even having said that, even uh, some of the 
native speakers might not even be able to understand that the text is exactly. so ambiguous or complex, um, let mm -hmm. alone then translators having to translate it. Yeah, I think in the legal world in general, there is a push to make uh, the the terminology more accessible to the common everyday person, the layman, as they say. Um, and so, yeah, when you are in a, an interpreting or translation context, it complicates that even further. So these plain English um, dictionaries are very useful because, um, you know, for the person who is involved in a court case or whatever, if, if they're not understanding um, what it is that they're being asked or what they're needing to respond, then it's not really serving the purpose of justice. Is it? So, <laughs> no. so that, that's part of it, I guess. That's right. And, you know, you actually have to understand what you're hearing before interpreting or translating it. So exactly. I think that um, these kind of resources really come in, uh, come in handy. Uh, for the translator and the interpreter. So thank you for compiling all those together. Um, what else is there? Um, so outside of the, uh, well, in the last one in that legal feature is uh, actual legislation that people can look up so to find the context okay. of a particular term uh, that is useful in actual, in, in document translation particularly, um, to know what different levels of government you need to look in to find the appropriate term. Um, but outside of the legal feature, feature we've got um, a few different areas too. Um, one that we found fun was the Auslan um, theatre interpreting. It was it was a fun piece that um, Linda and Christy wrote. Um, yeah, that, that that seemed a very interesting read as well. Tell me a little bit about that. Uh, well, they they were in the photo actually on the cover. That's the the cover photo we used. They they are the interpreters. So in the little window in in the set on stage, um, which you know isn't I think the usual position of a, of a Nozlan interpreter is usually out the front or to one side, and and occasionally they get put into the set as well, incorporated there. So this, that, is, this is really good. I'm looking at the uh, the cover now, and it's almost like they're a little bit of a couple of Juliets. In the balcony, yeah. waiting for the Because I think it was, yeah, I think it was a. Uh, I'm not sure if it was a Shakespearean, but it was, yeah, along that kind of context, and they're they're in the castle basically. <laughs> um. So yeah, that's fun. So they're talking about what it's like to interpret in a theatre uh, setting because there is a script. Um. So there is a lot of preparation they can do to some extent, although, um, you know, if someone forgets their line. <laughs> or ad libs a bit that that varies it um but hopefully that wouldn't be <laughs> too often but i'm sure the um, the auslan interpreters would be used to people uh potentially saying things that aren't on script especially well you know, yeah <laughs> we, we, we saw, we, we've been watching <laughs> a lot of um, that's right we've been watching a lot of uh auslan interpreters on the news these days i guess over the last year or so and i guess yeah. there have there have been some uh uh, curveballs thrown at politicians and uh, those answers <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure weren't scripted in most cases. No, I'm pretty sure they were. Anyway. Well, yeah, obviously as interpreters they're used to not knowing exactly what the person's going to say. Um, but an interesting factor that they put into is that like if the, the original script is a, I don't know, flowery type language, if they can make the, the signs more flowery, mm. like the... The hand movements more flowery as well, like to to create equivalence, I guess. So that that's an interesting thing I hadn't really thought about either. Have you have you ever seen any play that has been interpreted by no, sign language no. interpreters? And the main place I've seen Auslan interpreting is on TV usually, but yeah, I've not personally seen anyone any plays being interpreted live, no. Steph Linda, who I worked with uh, in the past, uh, who also reads the news for um, ABC uh, in Auslan, and uh, she, she is also a playwright, and I, I watched one of her plays on, on, uh, online, on YouTube. Oh, excellent. Yeah, and um, it, was, it was fascinating. It was amazing. So hopefully... Uh, there will be more and more of uh, these kind of plays. One thing that um, now that you mentioned that it reminded me that um, we've also included a link. Christy recorded an Auslan interpretation of this article for anyone who wants to view it 
in that format. All right, um, very good. Uh, what else do we have in this issue, Hayley? Um, another industry development area is um, covered by Nancy Guevara, and it's on a method called re-speaking, which I think she's actually just recently given a webinar on. It's a speech-to-text interpreting method um, for creating closed captions on a speedy basis. <laughs> We've been hearing a lot about this recently, speech-to-text. Um, Oh, do you know much about this? I actually didn't know much about it until we were um, collaborating with Nancy on this article. Um, so from what I understand, it's someone restates what's being said in a format that the the program will understand. So including uh, you have to say punctuation like to so that it will put that in the, the closed captions. Um, and some people do it um, and then interpreting like, so interpreting it, first of all, into the other language that it's going to appear in and then putting in all the commas and full stops and everything as wow. well at the same time. Sounds quite challenging. It does. <laughs> I would know where to, like, do, do you even think um, as someone speaking, you know, where there's a comma, a semicolon? And no, that would be some, and apparently, mark. apparently too that um, because, you know, if you're focused more on translating, you might think that's a bit of an impediment, but apparently not because it's just a whole different skill set to normal, normal interpreting. And even apparently some interpreters have to unlearn some of their skills because when, when you're practising interpreting, you're trying to keep your voice out of a monotone to keep it interesting like mm. normal speech. And apparently the, the program the that doesn't you're, like that. Pushing. It doesn't like that so much. So you got to try and speak more of a monotone. <laughs> and I guess you need to add emotions uh, with um, with is, do you, could you put smileys in there or <laughs> yeah, you know, emoticons so. <laughs> or, or many many exclamation marks. Yeah. <laughs> so um, it does sound like quite a challenging um, skill set, but um, a very interesting sort of new new area as as far as um, you know technology goes. I think there's a there's a lot of technological advancements in the last few years in our industry. We are very lucky, and we mm -hmm. have a lot of uh, extremely extremely uh, talented and uh, skilled uh, researchers in our universities, and um, uh, we we do get to learn a lot from them. And I think they really really shape our industry, and uh, not just in Australia, but I think internationally as well. So. Um, big kudos to our academics and, of course, the international ones. So there, there has been a, a lot of a lot of um, developments, I think, in the recent years. Definitely. Another uh, interesting article was on Indigenous languages um, uh, about Nati's Indigenous yeah. Interpreting Project. Can you tell me a bit about that one? Uh, yeah, so um, Nati is uh, looking to promote higher certification rates among interpreters of Indigenous languages. Um, and so. It's basically an update of um, where they were at. The, the Indigenous Interpreting Project was formed in 2012 and um, they have now been uh, working for the last two years on a rollout of the new NATI certification mm -hmm. system to try and get more people into, uh, certified and um, they have been making some great progress by the looks of things. Yeah, and uh, Lauren Campbell... Uh, gives an overview of the Indigenous Interpreting Project. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, I mean, in Victoria, we don't see a lot of Indigenous uh, language interpreters, um, but I think uh, in Western Australia and the Northern Territory, they are in demand language. Yeah, I think that is where it is more in, more in demand. Yeah, so uh, Lauren Campbell gives a really, really good overview of what the Indigenous Interpreting Project is uh, about and its history. And um, more and more uh, new languages are being added as well. The Indigenous languages that are being tested are being tested at the Certified Provisional Interpreter level. And uh, I was reading that, um, you know, there was a little bit of doubt, suspicion, whether uh, that uh, these languages would be able to be tested at this level. And, uh, you know, it was very successful. And um, we all know how difficult NATI tests can be. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we have these Indigenous interpreters um, that were successful uh, with getting their certification uh, in their languages. So big kudos to them as well as uh, the Definitely. Uh, 
as, as well as um, the, uh, the, the pioneers of this project as well. Another interesting article, and uh, I have to say my favorite uh, article in this season's edition was the literary translation article. Um, without giving too much away, because it's a beautiful read, uh, can you tell us a little bit about um, this issue's literary translation article? Yeah, sure, I'd love to. Um, so Jacasta Berry contacted us. It was actually a while ago now saying, oh, there's this really interesting project and I really would like to tell you about it. And um, we were lucky enough to have uh, included it in this uh, edition. And um, it was a subtitling project that she was asked to work on. And um, it turned out that the person who her client basically was a family member of the person who had produced these films and they were produced by in Spain I think to help get uh, Jewish people out of Germany during the second world war is that if I've got my details right yeah and uh, you know we're going back uh, uh, to 1920s 30s and I think um, uh, it all starts in Germany and then uh, you know Mm -hmm. uh, with, with the persecution against the Jews, there, there is a move to Spain, and then the industry is formed there again. And, and the, the platform or the companies used to uh, give work to uh, Jewish Germans and get them out mm -hmm. um, and, and produce these amazing films. Yeah, it's just a, an amazing story, isn't it? And um, so. The client, I think, had wanted to understand the films, which is why they were having them subtitled because it was part of their family history and legacy. That's yeah. right. So, um, you, you know, you had the, the, I think, the granddaughter uh, I think so, yeah. who, who wanted these uh, subtitles so that um, she could actually understand uh, what her grandfather's films were about. And I think there were some, some accompanying letters too that, that she translated as part of if I've got my facts straight. But, yeah, it's, as part of this project. So it is it is a fascinating read and um, one of those projects that, um, you know, makes your work as a, a translator or a subtitler a, a very interesting day, Indy. That's right. Look, sometimes, uh, you know, you're a translator yourself and uh, our work can be maybe a little bit mundane, not, not super interesting, <laughs> a bit repetitive, uh, but, uh, you know, every now and then you get these amazing projects, uh, yeah. which, which is, you know, in, in this particular uh, case could be quite life-changing. What else is on there? Um, you have also, uh, there was a, a, a play that was being reviewed called Stop Girl. Yeah, that was um, a last minute edition actually, and we're very glad to include it. Um, it was, it's a theatre, it's a play that's being held in um, Melbourne or shown in Melbourne. I think it's still on mm -hmm. until mid to end of April. Um, and the main character um, is an interpreter. So that's uh, not, not that common that. Um, you know, the protagonist of a film, or I mean, not a film, a, a play is is a translator or interpreter. Although um, apparently, um, they don't mention it that much in the in the actual play, but it is part of the context that the, the protagonist is is a interpreter working both as an interpreter but also as a, a journalist. I understand. I'm, I'm quite amazed how every edition you've managed to find either a, a play, a, a film. Um, uh, that has something to do with the TNI industry, and like you were saying, there aren't a lot of films and uh, no, TV there's series not very many <laughs> or plays about interpreters and translators. So I really appreciate uh, you and your team trying really hard to <laughs> find these things and put them on there for us. Yeah, well, it was actually thanks to Jean who contacted us to let us know. She said, oh, did you know that there's players on? And we went, wow, we have to include that if that's on. So, yeah, she she's the one who wrote it up for us and um, and she did a great job. So, yeah. Now, you also have a very, very uh, good way of um, making uh, official roles of Ozit interesting as well. You know? <laughs> um, I think. Uh, it says here it's a new series uh, to outline a different Ozit role in each issue. So who is yep. the lucky person 
in this issue? Who are we learning <laughs> about and um, what do they do? So our first um, volunteer for this <laughs> article was Joe Van Dalen. Um, he's been quite a few roles, um, but currently he's the chair, I think, of the South Australian and the Northern Territory branch. Um, and so he, it's along the lines of um, the magazine for a while now. It's had a, a short series, I mean, not a short series, a series called Three Quick Questions. So normally the Three Quick Questions is asking, interviewing someone who isn't a translator or interpreter themselves, but they work with translators and interpreters. Mm -hmm. And that's why we thought, well, it might be good to run something similar for um, actual OSIT roles, just so people can know what, what's involved and how they can get involved and how there are lots of ways to get involved. You know, it's not necessarily being um, one of the roles that takes up more time. It might be something more, more simple or less time and that everyone, you know, can put their hand up when they're, when I mean, they're able to. So. Look at what you do. Someone should be asking you three questions. Have they asked you three questions <laughs> yet? I mean, no, okay. maybe we could. <laughs> Your, your job seems like so much fun, you know, what you do for Ozit. And um, I think it's what, what you do with these uh, questions um, about, uh, I think uh, we said uh, the interview is Joe Van Dalen. Um, you know, it, it just puts a face to, to all these names and to what Ozit does yeah. and makes it more personable. And I think um, Ozit does so much for our industry. And uh, yes, people appreciate it but I think it can always be appreciated more well I think um, also it can feel a bit daunting if you're someone who's new to Ozit there's a whole bunch of roles and you don't you know there's a whole infrastructure there which is um very efficient in, in many cases and um you know if someone wanted to get involved they might be worried about I don't know how to do it or whatever um but there are there are always transitions from one person to the next in these roles. And, yeah, so the, the interview process is just to, I guess, shed a bit of light on them and um, that it's not a scary thing and it's often a lot of fun. Like in my case, it is quite a lot of fun. Yeah, definitely. And, uh, putting together. Know, and uh, these these uh, people who work at Ozit or Ozit, um, you know, they all have full-time jobs as well, don't they? They're interpreters, yeah. translators, academics. And uh, yeah. like you said, uh, it could be quite daunting for someone to go, oh, how am I going to do everything? And then this on top of that. So, again, I think making it more approachable and um, reading it and going, oh, okay, so that's what a chairperson does. Mm -hmm. um, and, and uh, you know, this is what their role, in tile, uh, role uh, is made up of. Um, so, yeah, no, look, I, I really enjoyed reading uh, that particular article as well. How uh, how can people submit if they have any ideas, if they have any articles? Um, I'm pretty sure you actively uh, try to reach out to people, uh, and uh, you know when you're when you're editing and putting this magazine together. But if, yeah. if, for example, I see a play or a movie with an interpreter as a protagonist, and I say, "You got to get this reviewed." Yes. Like, how do we? we how do we? How do we approach uh, the In Touch magazine and um, what's the process involved? Sure. So the, the easiest way is just to send us an email. So there's a couple of different emails. My one is intouch at ozit.org. Um, and Helen, my co-editor, uh, her email is editor at ozit.org. So um, either of those emails or um, it could be anyone on the editorial committee too, which all of their emails are in the inside cover of the magazine if you ever need to contact us and you've forgotten our emails that's where you'll find all of our contact details and um now that you mentioned it actually we are running a call in this issue asking if anyone would like to become a reviewer so this is you know when a new textbook comes out that's mm. translation or interpreting related uh, we like to include a review and um there are so many interesting books that um even with the whole editorial <laughs> committee um it would be quite a, a workload to try and get through them all so if there is a, a book or um that you come across that you'd like to uh review for us we'd love to hear from you and even what we're actually doing is compiling a list of people who would be interested in reviewing and when a book comes along that aligns with your interest then we can choose you line you up with the book basically so um 
yeah, if anyone is interested in, in doing that, please send us an email and, and we'd love to have you on our list. <laughs> uh, very good. Look, I'm going to put your email in the episode description as well so people can Great. easily access Thank that. You. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, if you are interested in reviewing a book for the In Touch magazine about uh, translating and interpreting, contact Haley, um, and uh, she will guide you in relation to that. Um, and uh, look... We are going to repeat this probably every episode uh, as we get new members into our industry. I think it's important to repeat this. Um, how do we access the In Touch magazine? Sure. Where do we find it? How do I read it? Uh, do I get it in the mail? How do I access it? <laughs> okay, so the, there's two main ways to access it online. Um which most issues are only online uh, these days. So the first way is through the Ozit website. Um, if you click on the website, so it's ozit.org and then publications and what does it say? Media. Um, and under that is the, now I've briefed my thing. Then the first option is In Touch magazines and that, that's where all of the episodes are. That's in PDF format. Um, another way to view it on that's a bit more device friendly depending on which device you're using to read it um, is the issue uh, version which if you download it onto your device then you can look up the in touch magazine there's like a subscription basis and it will appear or i think there is also a link on the on the website thank you so much Haley. Uh, i guess i will see you in another three months or so uh, yep, for the I'd next like edition and um, looking forward to chatting with you again I hope you're keeping safe there with your family in Mexico all as well. Yes, all as well. Thankfully, I've, I've got a bit of a um, – I had laryngitis last week, but, yes, I'm all good now. Just yes, for um, we, we tried but. to do this recording last week initially, <laughs> and um, I kept on uh, saying, Hayley, I can't hear you. Unmute yourself. <laughs> and uh, it was yeah, actually – And I woke that, up with no voice. It was <laughs> actually that she lost her voice, and um, she already had unmuted, but uh, little did I know. <laughs> Uh, so, Haley, thank you so much for, I know that uh, you're not 100% recovered yet, and um, I really appreciate you chatting with me today about uh, the autumn edition of In Touch magazine. No worries. Thank you very much for having me, and um, I look forward to keeping in touch. All Graduates Conversations Podcast.